Well, I want to answer that in a couple of uh, a couple of ways. I think, first of all, I agree with you. There's a tension, and it's a healthy tension, a creative tension. The tension that comes with Paul's in but not of the world. Mm -hmm. The tension that comes with the fact that this guy Jesus is both human and divine. Mm -hmm. There is this healthy tension that Christians uh, live with. But on the other hand, I'd say users of the book, if they can't tolerate that tension, they don't have to. If you cease the sermon as a spiritual uh, uh, message purely, so don't use the stuff that's there right. that can help you uh, to uh, criticize society. I don't recommend it, but you can certainly use it that way. Right. But on the other hand, if you're somebody who is a, quote, liberation pastor, a liberation theologian, who thinks that every sermon has to be about social justice, you've got the resources to do it. Okay, okay. so it's a, it's a pick and choose, and, and that's another aspect of the Holy Spirit leading you. That exactly. the, you, the Holy Spirit could lead you to what you want to use out of this, but this is the resource that allows you a, a whole spectrum of uh, ideas and directions for your sermon. Reviewers of the book, I don't know if you had a chance to see uh, the positive uh, reviews and promotional literature that's been written, they understood me perfectly. I start out the book saying, I am not providing you with sermons. Mm -hmm. I want the pulpit to be yours, user. Uh, all I'm doing is giving you some ideas. Take what is right for your context, take what's right for you, but don't use it all. That's exactly why it doesn't matter what your denomination is. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. There's something in here for you, precisely because you don't have to use Ellingson's ideas. Okay. You just get some data here that can help you in formulating your sermon. Okay, great. So it does free us up to be moved by the Holy Spirit. That's sure. Great. great. Um, you've done something unique here. At, I'm not familiar with lectionary uh, tradition, but unique in just my understanding of sermon helps from... Uh, from uh, different books, and that is you've created a chart, and I want you to explain it, a chart that helps those that might not necessarily come from the same theological tradition that you do in all different areas of theology. Can you explain that chart and how you apply it? Well, I don't know if you meant uh, there's actually two separate charts oh. at the beginning. Uh, one pertaining to the books of the Bible, and then one pertaining to theology. Which well, one should I talk uh, about? Why don't you do the theology one first, and then we'll do the books of the Bible. I was concerned, as I said, the thing that made me the most nervous about uh, writing this book was that part where I actually talk about sermon moves, because I don't want users to think they have to use my ideas mm -hmm. exactly, and that's the only worth the value of the book. So my thinking was to insulate non-Lutherans, to insulate non-Norwegians from Ellingson's uh, suppositions, <laughs> I would provide a chart of every major doctrine. Mm -hmm. And then the user of the book can see under each doctrine, what historically have been the different ways that doctrine's been described. Example, all the different images that have been historically used to describe the Trinity to make it easier in there. On justification, on salvation, all the different approaches to whether you're saved by grace alone, faith alone, grace and works, they're all there. So here's what the user does. The wise user says, okay, now in this idea that Ellingson's given me, uh, he seems to be in this camp, but that's not where my denomination is, that's not where my heart is. And then I've got a, a way of helping that user identify what he or she believes. Okay, knowing that, knowing where uh, the writer is coming from, knowing where the preacher wants to be, that will help the reuser of the book to modify my ideas a little, mm -hmm. just to shape where he or she is at. Right. But then there's another benefit, I think, to this use of these charts. You see, this is a book, then, that can be used in Sunday schools when pastors, when lay people want to instruct their congregations mm -hmm. on the various teachings of their churches. They can find their denominational views there in relation to other denominational views. It's a, it's a, it's a Christian education opportunity yeah. that this book provides, too. So use it in the pulpit. Use right. it for the pulpit, but use it in Sunday school, too. Right, right, right. Uh, could, you, could you go on to explain the books of the Bible chart that you have? It's well, basically, it was an, uh, an attempt to economize, uh, to keep the book short and cheaper. Right. Uh, rather than on every text to provide the whole analysis of the book of the Bible, let's mm -hmm. say Mark, we okay. use so many. So rather than have an analysis of Mark's gospel in every single Sunday, it appears, I've got these series of charts for books that actually appear a lot of times, like Mark. So, for example, under Mark, and another book that appears a lot in the coming church year, is Isaiah. It's there for Isaiah. It's there for various epistles. What you find there is a little section with a couple of bullet points on who wrote the book, when it was written, why it was written. Right. Then, 
several bullet points under the heading parts of the book. You can see which chapter fits in which section, how the chapters relate together. Very brief. All this is on just one page. Right. Then another section with several bullet points, main theological emphases. What is Paul trying to get at in Romans? What points are Mark trying to make? Mm -hmm. It's right there. Right. And then finally a category that says distinct emphases. How is Mark different from all the other Gospels? Right. How is Isaiah different from all the other prophecies? It's just right there, handy. Yeah. Yeah. Now this is going to be a, a great use then to the preacher in putting together a sermon. But I see again, back to Sunday school, back to Christian education, this is a real handy tool right. to be used in helping to introduce new books of the Bible for Bible studies. Yeah. Uh, as I'm, as you're talking, I'm thinking about exactly what you're saying. How useful this thing is, and I'm thinking about those like myself who don't come from a lectionary tradition. And I'm, I'm in the uh, Bible bookstore, and I look at lectionary preaching, and I see lectionary, and I think that's not for me. I got to move on to my tradition. Uh, so I would ask you, how? What would you say? You've got 400 plus students down at ITC Seminary. And this is the way it is, seminaries around the nation and pastored on the nation. What would you say to them to say, listen, this isn't your tradition, but wow, this is a really great uh, resource available to you. What, what would you do to encourage them to pick this thing up and use it? Here's what I say to my Baptist friends. Here's what I say to my Pentecostal friends, mm -hmm. Methodists who don't use a lectionary. Here's what I say. I say, every Sunday, it's got to be tough. You've got to pick, not just, you've got to not just write the sermon. First, you've got to pick the text, right? Right. And so I get in a conversation with my friends and talk about how, in a way, it feels liberating, perhaps, to choose your own text. But isn't it a burden? Isn't it a burden to be fresh? I think there's something about human nature. There's this African theologian who taught me uh, a doctrine called original sin, yeah. St. Augustine. He says the problem is that we are manipulators. Mm. We can even manipulate the Bible and Christianity to suit our aims. Mm. So what... This book, what a lectionary can do to help you is to get you away from yourself. You see, I know sometimes I envy my Baptist friends because they can pick whatever they want. Because right. my own predisposition is I'm a God, God's love freak. I'm a grace freak. Right. I preach on that every Sunday if I didn't have a lectionary. Right. But these assigned texts, which the ancestors in the faith have said, you should pay attention to somewhere in the course of the year. Right. These assigned texts force me to look at things I might just as soon forget. Uh, uh, yeah. right. I'm not a big fan of the book of James, but there's a whole bunch of sermon ideas in the book of, on the book of James in here. Right. Uh, it's not fun to preach sometimes on passages from First and Second Kings. Mm. I mean, after you get away from right. uh, First right. and Second Samuel and David, uh, it uh, starts to go dry. Right. So, the idea of a lectionary, of having texts forced on you, preacher, mm -hmm. makes you preach on some things that you might not have done otherwise. Right. And I call that feeding the flock. Yeah. So that their piety is really a Christian piety and not just about you. Right. On top of that, think of the spiritual enrichment when we get out of ourselves. Right. And have to look at aspects of the biblical witness yeah. that we've been overlooking. Yeah. So that's the way I'd sell it to uh, okay. you know my uh, friends from traditions like yours. Right. I guess if I had a choice and the publisher didn't own it, I would have said, let's let's come up with a different word, word yeah. lectionary. Yeah. Uh, right, <laughs> right. But it, it, what you're talking about is the whole counsel of God, that that this is pushing toward that direction. Let's get a, the the, wet, the, uh, the the width, the breadth, the depth, and the height of the Word of God, everything. So I'd say non-lectionary uh, uh, preachers from denominations that don't use it, buy the book anyway. You don't have to follow it. You don't have to use it uh, on a given Sunday, but you might just see some books of the Bible analyzed right. here that you've been dodging, that you've been overlooking, and hey, you sort of been feeling guilty about it. Now you've got some ideas how to handle these texts. <laughs> that's great. That's great. That's good. Um, how long is this second? Are you going to be? Uh, it says in here that you're writing more. How many of these? What, how many years are you going to be doing this? It's, it seems like a tremendous amount of work. Well, I have uh, again. I've no noted that the common lectionary uh, recycles itself every three years. Okay. Uh, for three years in a row, you have a different set of texts. So I was contracted by the publisher CSS uh, okay. to uh, for three years, meaning uh, the, the cycle. And okay. this is the first. Uh, I have uh, two more. I'm just about done with the second one, and then right. uh, we'll have the third. Is a lot of work. Yes and no. I mean, you know, writing is a lot of work, right. but it's also a joy. Uh, I would say I'm certainly putting in my uh, hours, uh, but it's been so rewarding as a church historian 
for me to get back in exegesis yeah. again. Yeah. So enriching. And then, of course, uh, by the way, this is another aspect of this book. Anybody who ever wondered what theology and church history have to do with preaching, you need to look at this book because uh, I have mined the insights of the great theologians mm -hmm. of the past, what they say about these texts, and even giving you some juicy quotes that can really get you excited right. about uh, preaching on some themes in that Bible text. Also, this notion of how science might be testified to in the biblical text, how psychology relates to a given text. Right. Once again, this gives you an, instant, an, an opportunity user to see how these disciplines can inform your preaching. So yes, all these things are going on. Is it a lot of work? Yes. Yeah. Has it been a lot of fun and enriching? Yes, too. Yeah. Okay, let, let me ask you this. Um, in the midst of this, are you doing any other work? Is there anything else coming up from you? Well, you know very well, could you help me on uh, one? Uh, I have a contract for a book called African Christian Mothers and Fathers. Now, I've done a book uh, several years ago, still in print, mm -hmm. on the richness of Augustine. Mm -hmm. uh, but there were many important African theologians before Augustine. Right. Some influenced him, some he's reacting against. And so this new book that I'm also working on uh, explores the thought of these earlier African mm -hmm. theologians who were very different from Augustine, some of whom were women, by the way, right. nuns, mothers of the desert. And so this book, I think, will also be a way of complementing the early book, helping users to see the richness that exists in early African thinking, some yeah. of which is, in, is reflected in the black church this day. Right, right. Uh, I know that uh, in, in dealing with your students who you are very much a library champion, you send them up here and I'm always interacting with them, always what I'm hearing, Dr. Ellingson wants primary sources. And in, in looking for information for you, it's always, Brad, can you find the primary sources? Can you tell me, uh, tell us, what is a primary source and why is it so important to get to those primary sources? Okay, there's a distinction in scholarship between primary sources and secondary sources. Mm -hmm. Secondary sources are the textbooks, the uh, books that are written about the figures you are using. So, for example, uh, when it comes to what I say about the Bible in this book, those are secondary sources. Mm -hmm. The primary source, though, is the book itself, the writer itself, the ancient writer. The primary source, when you're studying the Bible, is the Bible itself. Right. Now, in terms of my students uh, teaching church history as I do, uh, I want them not just to see what Ellingson and other interpreters say about St. Augustine, say about Martin Luther King, say about Martin Luther. I want them to read the actual writings of Augustine, Martin right. Luther King, and Martin Luther. Those are the primary sources. Right. That's where the gold is. And by the way, that's the thing about this book. I don't analyze what Dr. King, what James Cohn, what Martin Luther and John Wesley right. say. Right. I actually give the quotes. Yeah. In other words, this is a book full of primary sources. I'm right. practicing what I preach. Right. Uh, exactly. I, uh, what I tell my students to do, the professor does it too. <laughs> uh, and so I think this is a great opportunity for users to really maybe learn some things, it's not the main focus of the book, to right. really learn some things about the founder of their tradition. What did he or she actually say? Right. Some of those insights are in this book for you. That's great. That's great. Uh, just the little I read, I was very encouraged by all that was available here, thinking that if I had the opportunity to preach again, that this was, would be a resource that I really would want to use. So, um, thank you very much for the book. And thank you oh, very thank much you. for your time. Thanks for your time. I appreciate you being here again. Okay, I'm sure uh, we're going to have you here again with the next one rolls around. Thank you very much.